Hi, my name is Cora Price, and this is Suffragitsu, how the suffragettes communicated the absolute necessity for the vote using jujitsu. The suffragettes, selfless pioneers for women's rights or delusional lunatics. England can't seem to decide. One thing is for sure, though, they have a very clear way of communicating what they want, and these women want to vote. Sorry, I should introduce myself. My name is Philip Griffiths, and I'm a reporter for the Oxford Times. I have come out to London to write about the suffragettes and their struggle to get the vote. Did you know the first petition for the right for women to vote was way back in 1832? Sadly, the petition failed. 35 years later, John Stuart Mill, a member of Parliament, made another petition. It contained over 1,500 signatures, but it still failed to earn women the vote. There were other petitions after that, but they didn't work. It didn't look like, it didn't look like petitions were going to get suffrage, at least not any time soon. So, women turned to something else, peaceful protest. In 1897, Millicent Fawcett formed the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. They started organizing large peaceful protests and marches. Unfortunately, English lawmakers still didn't seem particularly inspired to give women the vote. Then, in 1903, a woman named Emmeline Pankhurst formed the Women's Social and Political Union, or WSPU. They wanted the vote too, but they had more direct means of getting it. And this is where our story really begins. Conditions for women in the early 1900s were not ideal. They couldn't vote, couldn't hold many jobs that men could, and couldn't become a member of parliament. There was unfair custody, unfair wages, etc. The point is, life was not fair, and unfortunately, they couldn't permanently change any of these things without the vote. But, once they could vote, they could start introducing laws to help change these things and make England a better place. I looked up from my writing, and that's when I saw a woman wearing a votes for women sash. When I asked her about why the suffragettes use the methods of communication that they do, she answered, I'm asked this a lot, and you might not get it, but after decades of petitioning and peacefully protesting to get the vote, some of us got kind of fed up. We asked for the vote, and we were ignored. We petitioned, still nothing. We peacefully protested, still nothing. Instead, we started to yell and riot, and we're told to calm down and ask politely. There was not going to be any change if we simply asked politely and waited. So we demanded change. We finally get England's attention, though not always in a good way. For example, on November 18, 1910, what would come to be known later as the Black Friday protest took place. It was a nightmare. The suffragettes were attacked by over 300 police officers and angry crowd members. Two women were killed over 100 arrested, and countless injured. But of course, the next day, we get up and go protesting again. Why? Because we have to be a constant issue. We can't let them forget about us. So we throw rocks at windows, and then they arrest us. They even beat us unconscious. We go on hunger strike, and we're force-fed with plastic tubes up our noses. We release I through I said, like, well, I use something called a letter bomb, and I get caught, arrested, and force-fed again. Unfortunately, this cycle happens not only with me, but with the majority of the suffragettes. We endure not only the wrath of the police, but the distaste of the media. They make propaganda that displays us as irrational little children or ugly brutes. They also show what happened to the poor husbands and men if women got the vote, and what the husbands of the suffragettes have to deal with. Look, he comes home and his family is in life within a degree. Not only that, but the house is a mess. How horrifying. Of course, we have propaganda of our own. Some of it is just as nice to look at as the propaganda against us. And some of it shows the ugly truth of what happens to us. Force feedings, beatings, and more. Due to the 1913 Cat and Mouse Act, those who go on hunger strike can be released only to be rearrested when they regain their health. We needed some way to break out of this cycle, so Mrs. Pankhurst asks for the help of a woman named Edith Garrett, a master at jujitsu, a Japanese martial art. She says that she trained some of the suffragettes. I volunteered, and a couple of days later, I did the dojo for my first lesson. My name is Edith Garrett, and as you know, I'm going to be training you how to protect yourself as well as the other suffragettes. Now, no one should be manhandling you, not even the police. So today, I will be teaching you two takedowns and one attack. For the first takedown, they're going to have one hand in their collar and one hand in their sleeve. And they're going to step across their body, get their hips below yours, and bring both of your hands to their collar, well, to their sleeve. Then you're going to turn, and down they go. 
For the next take down, you're going to have the same grip, one hand in the collar, one hand in the sleeve. Then you're going to step across their body and pull them across it. Now with both of these, they end up on the ground with their arm in the air and you're holding it. So you're going to step across their face and break their arm across your knee. Now you're not going to break your partner's arm, just apply a little bit of pressure like so, so that you know that you're doing it right. That's all. Now, the after class, I'm told about an upcoming speech that Emily and Pankers will be giving. These, let's just say that the suffragettes have some surprises in store for them. But no matter what happens, it'll be a victory for the WSPU. If they win, the police look like idiots. If they lose, they go down martyrs. One officer named Officer Davis told the press after the speech, The men arrived at the speech shortly after it started. Emmeline Pankhurst Pinker, was giving it on a stage lined with bouquets of flowers. When we went up to arrest her as well as the other suffragettes, they started flipping us onto the bouquets of flowers. We then figured out that there was barbed wire in the bouquets of flowers. While we were stuck, they came up and started breaking our arms. We then eventually overwhelmed them, but not before these brutes inflicted severe damage on many of my men. That's all. The odds were entirely in our favor. The press and the public were slowly becoming more sympathetic to the suffragettes. That day, the women left in handcuffs as martyrs, and because of the fight that they put up, they were taken more seriously. This had mixed reactions with the public. Some thought them a bigger threat than before, and others thought that they were brave and supported them. But, but many of the police officers still, as days went by, they just felt dragged into this pointless war of legal rights. Even though many didn't have any opinions either way, it was still our job and our duty to fight these women. Love them or hate them, but you can't deny that they're here to stay. Those who thought them weak saw their strength. Those who thought them dumb heard their intelligence. And those who thought women were swayed so easily saw how relentless and stubborn the suffragettes were. As the days went by, they proved themselves a force to be reckoned with. Then, a war broke out. When England entered the Great War, the suffragettes put their protests on hold to help with the war efforts. When it ended in 1918, the suffragettes, well, and all women, were given the vote. In the first parliamentary election, when, when women could vote, 17 women ran for members of parliament. That year, Constance Montevices became the first female member of parliament. But she declined to swear allegiance to the king and take her seat in the House of Commons. One year later, Nancy Astor became the first female member, well, the second female member of parliament and the first female to take her seat in the, in the House of Commons. She was ignored and yelled at by the other people there. One year later, in 1921, she was joined by Margaret Wintringham. There were two females in a sea of males. It must have taken a lot of courage. Diane Abbott, 1987, she became the first female member, well, she became the first black female, female member of parliament. Margaret Thatcher, 1979, she became the first female to become a prime minister. All of these women were empowered by the vote to become anything they wanted to. Because of women before them, who had a goal and were willing to do whatever it took to make that goal and that dream a reality. Our world today isn't free from sexism, but continually striving for improvement can help ensure that someday our descendants won't grow up with the same stereotypes and sexism that we do. This is what the suffragettes wanted, and this is why they did what they did. They used everything from jujitsu to breaking windows, from peaceful protest to hunger strike. The suffragettes communicating the absolute necessity for the vote. Well, they're so incredible. How I can put it best is the daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, Christabel Pankhurst, put in the suffragette newspaper. For the sake of justice, the militant woman has surrendered all thought of self, and that is why the material force of the law fails to subdue them. The law may imprison, may torture, may kill, but it cannot make women afraid, and it cannot make them surrender.